And we acknowledge that today's board meeting is being held within the traditional territory of the Deneza and Treaty 8. We have one addition to the agenda under number 15, which is recording of meetings, new business. Other than that change, can I get a mover and seconder to the agenda, please? Moved by Thomas, seconded by Bill. We've done the addition. Okay. Ida's sitting in the sunshine. She looks beautiful. Um, all in favor? We will mention that Nicole Gillis is online, but her recording uh, video is not working. So she is attending via audio only. We don't have presentations or delegations. We'll look at trustee inputs and celebrations and we'll start with trustee Campbell. I've been to a few events at the schools. I've been to Duncan Cran, uh, Taylor. I went to a donation uh, check for the seamless kindergarten. I've been to all three PAC meetings at the schools. And I think that's photo. Okay. Trustee Gillis. <coughs> we'll come back to her. Vice Chairman Lehman sends her regrets. Trustee Scott Moncrief, we'll come back to him if he attend is comes in trustee just, snow uh dave just texted me he's running late and okay thank you yeah, i have been to all my schools two or three times the past month um i have went to the fundraiser for the basketball teams at the high school which was really nice um then uh, basketball season right now so i've been to several the elementary games. Um, yeah, just been bouncing around. <laughs> um, well, everything's going good. All right. Trustee Witten. Um, so went to two of my schools in the last month or so there. Um, Central, I had the opportunity to be part of their French Immersion Week. Uh, end off celebrations in the gym where they took a picture of everybody. It was fantastic. Kids got up and did a whole lot of singing and dancing. Um, it was it was a great time to be there. Uh, went to a pack meeting at Alwyn Holland, and then uh, I followed that up with this past Friday. We actually went skiing, cross country skiing, um, where I managed to mess myself up a little bit, but we had an absolutely great time, and all the kids really enjoyed it. I think it really reiterates how important those outdoor activities are. Um, started a lot of really good conversation about getting the kids out of the classroom a little bit. And I have very fond memories about when I was a child doing stuff like that. So, Thank you. Christy Gillis? Yeah, sorry. I'm on now. Um, I attended the Hudson's Love, been to the Hudson's Love School numerous times, but I helped the pack with a movie night that they hosted a couple weeks ago on a Friday night. They had the movie E.T. play in their gym. First time they've done a movie night probably since COVID. Um, people in Hudson's Hope love it because, well, we don't have a movie theater, obviously, but also even taking your whole family to the movie, you know, is very expensive. So Derek was saying that he'd heard a few of the families mention how this is, you know, a great inexpensive family night to be able to afford goodies and a movie so nice to see that it was a fundraiser for the girls volleyball team I believe as well as PAC um, I had to provincial council in Vancouver this coming Friday and I just want to say because I'm not on video um, I guess just assume I'm in favor if I if I am not I'll stay opposed if that maybe okay. makes it easier yep thank you Okay, like Bill, I enjoyed the basketball fundraiser too. Um, I did, on behalf of the board, attend an equity scan meeting 
where pa parents of in-town Aboriginal students were asked to complete a survey. Meeting was well organized and a positive event with follow-up plans to uh, have Indigenous support workers reach out to more families. And they're in the process of planning meetings right now for non-urban rights holders. Prespa 2 graduation was absolutely amazing uh, in terms of both decorations and the sense of community. I certainly enjoyed seeing the pride of the 15 graduates on the stage and that community was behind them and the gym was packed. So um, I attended a focus group for the development of the Hospital Foundation strategic plan. There's an overlap between some of their challenges and ours that was interesting to listen to. Got to go to a PAC meeting at Ma Murray and they were trying a daytime one as a creative way to get more people out. With Stephen and Angela, I attended the partner liaison meeting in Vancouver. Um, I will do a more fulsome report out on that at the Committee of the Whole because the materials aren't on the hub yet. But I noticed there's lots of materials from Academy on the hub if you were looking for those. Um, I did attend a, the NPA meeting last week. They are changing some of their processes around their meetings so our attendance may not be needed on a monthly basis, but I'll, I'll let you know about that. And that's it for me. Okay. Moving on to item number five, minutes of the regular board meeting of January the 23rd, 2023, which is pages six to 12 in your agenda package. A minute, to, a bit of time to look at that. Thanks, Leah. Could I get a, a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Bill, seconded by Ida. Are there any errors or omissions noted? Okay. All in favor? Carried. Business arising. I did on the uh, superintendent's report, the K-12 reporting policy that Jared presented. I did mention to Stephen that trustees would like some talking points as that starts to come up closer to June and has becomes more of a, a community thing. And the other thing I noted is Jared said there was a lengthy support document regarding retention. I wasn't able to find it. So I'm wondering, Stephen, if you could get that sent to us, please and thank you. You bet. Okay. If there's anything 
further direction you want to give Stephen around talking points, feel free. Uh, what I'll be doing, uh, Helen, is sort of summarizing for trustees the, the key information that has just started to come out and the stuff that we get from the ministry, and then I can run that by you as a draft. Okay. All right. All right. Any other business related to those minutes? All right. We'll move on then to... Item number six, minutes of the special regular board meeting of February the 13th, which is pages 13 to 14 in your package. Could I get a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Thomas, seconded by Ida. Any errors or omissions? Okay. All in favor? Carried. Item number seven, approval of the excerpts of the regular board meeting of uh, December the 12th, which is page 15 in your package. Could I get a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Thomas, seconded by Ida. Any errors or omissions? No, okay. All in favor? Carried. Right. Moving on to announcements. We had put the board advance in red because I was back and forth at that point with Madeline. Um, and she is going to be back. So the board advance will go ahead on March the 6th. I wasn't sure we were going to have enough people because I know Nicole's away at that point in time. So Sorry, what is that? March the 6th. What is, what is board It's advance? a Monday. I think he means what occurs at a board advance. Okay, what occurs at a board advance. Um, Stephen and I are working on, on sort of totally fleshing out the um, agenda, but part of it will be our opportunity to take a good look at the district data we're going to talk about our communications plan and communication protocols. Um, we will put together what are our guiding documents for us as a board and continue some of the board orientation work. And we hope to build in some contact time between senior district staff and trustees in connection to the areas of their responsibility. So we've talked about it, but I don't have an actual agenda I can put in your hands at this moment. Do you want to add anything, Stephen? No, nope, that sounds that sounds good. So it's more or less a pro D day for us. Yeah. And we talked about supper on the Sunday night with the Monday full day. And I used to be called a retreat, like a for the trial. Completely makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Helen doesn't retreat. She only advances. So we don't use the retreat word. You know the list here. March 6th. March 6th. Uh, it's up. Right there. So the only other thing that may end up happening 
is um, Regional Science Fair may do an awards evening on the 14th. Um, I have to reach out to Kevin to confirm that and I'll let you know. I know David attended that last year on our behalf and thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I'll be out of town in Maple Ridge doing their framework review around the regional science fair time. So I know they'll be looking for, for support and judges and things. And there's lots of school ones coming up right now. Oh, Helen, is that April or May or March? That's that's in April. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. April twelfth and thirteenth. So. Anything else people seeing that are is missing off of our calendar? All right. Moving on to senior staff reports, we're looking at pages 16 and 17 in your agenda package. Take it away, Stephen. Oh, sorry, is it, can you see my screen, Helen? Yep. Terrific, okay, thank you, Chair. And so there's a number of items in my report tonight, actually. Number one is the activity report around the human resources. The item number two is the online uh, superintendent's report, and I'll, I'll go through that now. Um, under intellectual development of our framework, uh, we've been working on a number of curriculum and planning grids that are available almost all the way through K to nine now for the different subject areas. And this has been a great tool that some of our postal responsibilities and some of our teachers that we brought in for Pro-D have been using to plan out their year as well as their units using what we call a backward design. This is particularly helpful for new staff or uh, teachers on letters of permission uh, who don't necessarily have, you know, long serving templates for their planning. Also available now to trustees and the public is the ministry reports that they put out each year on the student, <clears throat> pardon me, student success website. Um, this is just a sample here. And as uh, Helen mentioned, we'll be going through a number of data points, both provincial uh, and district and local to schools uh, when we meet together for the trustee advance. This particular graph shows the overall grad rate. Um, and, and while it's up uh, overall, we, we saw a decline in our Indigenous uh, grad rate that in the spring of 2022. So that's something that we're looking at more closely as we speak. Uh, this is not news to the trustees, uh, but uh, our district, the, the ministry did put out an official announcement a couple of weeks ago about uh, SD60 being a provincial online school provider. And uh, that continues to be in a, a bit of a setup mode in terms of moving over to the new software and uh, making registrations available to students both within and from without our outside of our district. Under human social development is just a, a bit of a good news story in terms of some of our ELC grade 10 students able to go back to the hospital and start volunteering. That's something they had been doing for quite a while and uh, that they picked up again here uh, post the, the serious part of the pandemic. Lots of things happening in mind over in, in careers and skill development. I was up at the high school for the beginning of this camp on the 31st, and it was a number of middle school students that were invited to North Peace through a career program that provided actually some equipment as well as training around welding. And uh, the companies are very generous with the kits and the resources that they leave behind in these camps. Trustees are aware uh, since our previous presentation by Mr. Campbell around uh, the support that the district is offering for Ukrainian students and families. This is a particular federal program called Kuwait, Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. We're up to 27 students and it is growing. Just a quick update on our, our POPI program. This is Pro-D for uh, struggling, struggling and uh, beginning and struggling readers. And uh, we have a few of these that happen throughout the year and this one's coming up in April. 
Trustees are familiar with the uh, newsletter of the North Peace Secondary School Indigenous Ed Department, and this is an update of some of the events that are happening in and around their school as they begin a new semester. And I was able to go by there at the beginning of the new semester, visit a number of classes, and uh, they are well underway. Uh, we heard from Trustee Witten about the French Immersion Week, and so there's a few uh, pictures here along with some descriptors of the different events that occurred throughout the week at Ecole Central Elementary School. We also heard about Robert Ogilvie's uh, breakfast, uh, and that was open to the community and to everyone, and uh, it, uh, it was enjoyed by all, and it was a very substantial breakfast in the end, so that was fantastic. They're also doing a fundraiser for Jump Rope for Heart. Uh, people will be familiar and hear about this from different elementary schools. And here's one school and one program that uh, you can look into and donate if you so wish. Finally, Alan Holland uh, completed a number of coding activities from K to grade six. And uh, the students enjoyed those and came into the common area of the school to, uh, to participate, building microchips, programming robots that we call spheros, and uh, programming them to drive around in certain ways. And so that was well received. That is, <clears throat> pardon me, my online report. And then um, if you look at the agenda, I've also, item number two, I've included information on this, the Provincial K-12 Anti-Racism Action Plan that was just uh, put out by the ministry. And so that's for uh, review of trustees. Um, and number three is, as usual, some out of district field trips uh, for approval. And number four, community coaches approval. And finally, number five, post of responsibility. So if those can be broken out separately. And that is my report. Right. Could I have a mover and seconder for Stephen's report with the exception of the out of district field trips, community coaches, and posts of responsibility? Okay, I can't see the Zoom room. I I'm, think yeah. I see Thomas waving. Tom and David. Thomas and David. Okay, moved by Thomas, seconded by David. All right. <clears throat> Let's go through the areas of Stephen's report. Um, we'll start off with the Human Resources Summary Report because I wanted to twig on there. We've got a retiree up. Uh, the district retirement dinner and recognition is scheduled for June the 7th, 7th. So please put that in your calendar and hold that day open as trustees. It is happening and, there. And Helen, uh, the both the Indigenous Ed Department and all of the schools have been informed of that date. Thank you. Any other questions related to the Human Resources Summary Report? All right, we'll go through the electronic report area by area and inviting any comments or questions from trustees. So the first area was the SD60 curriculum grids. Any comments or questions about those? I just looked at them and went, they're a great idea and a great planning tool, especially as noted in the report for our, our people on LOPs. So the second item was one of the reports on student achievement from the ministry. And Stephen already noted that we have an increased gap in that one for our indigenous students. Um, that will be something that they're, that's going to be followed up on. Um, there's two or three other ones that are part of that report. Any other questions or comments? I have a big Stephen in a little tiny room. <laughs> <laughs> Distributed learning, provincial, the fact that we're now a PLO and can have students from other districts register sounds wonderful. But in talking with Sean, there was only, I think, two places that applied that didn't get a PLO status. So it's not as small a group that we, we thought it might be to have us attracting. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see how that happens. 
Yeah, a couple of related items for that for trustees, Helen, and that yeah. is that um, there were we, they ended up, I believe, with 14 polls around the province where we had initially assumed there would be six or seven. And yeah. so that information changed as the process continued. Also, you need to know that because of the timing of when all of this was approved, we missed some significant registration windows uh, for September and February until it was finally confirmed. And so this is more like a two to three year process than a one year process. And so our, our distributed learning is, is going to be in rebuilding mode as far as this particular, the polls. And my understanding, but I can't confirm this, is that after the three year contract, there may be a change in the number of polls providers around the province. Thank you. Well, when we look at a, a number of those um, courses that we've given approval for locally approved courses, they really are offering some things that are quite unique. Um, and so hopefully that will be a draw. Oh, and we have a question. And, and, yeah, and, and Helen, no. if you go, if you go to um, the screen of the boardroom and hover over it and hit the three dots, yep. you can select pin, uh, pin this, what does it say? It says pin it. Pin? Okay, pin. I pinned it. Great, so you should now see a bigger boardroom. Yeah, I do, thank you, yep. Bill. All right. So Stephen, this, I love it, it's a great idea. But my question is with it, is it is, with our shortage of teachers, is it potentially going to affect our in-person amount of teachers we have? I think, you know, your, your, your question um, is a good one. And being a polls provider doesn't change the need to ask that question. We've had a distributed learning program for a number of years, as you know. It's not only serving students at a distance and cross-enrolling local students, it's also, of course, become the way in which we, just, we uh, handle our education services at Buick Creek School. And so uh, there are a number of different services that it is providing. And we went through, of course, consultation with their, their staff and the administration there as far as their desire and you know, in, to be a polls provider. And it was clear that in order to keep doing some of the things they're doing currently, including quite a number of registrations, typically for some private services down south for the work experience course, which actually brings in uh, good funding to that program, uh, they knew that they needed to apply to be a Pulse provider. Whether we are or whether we aren't, it still will always require some staffing and uh, at the distributed learning, uh, key learning center. And just just so you know, I had a family member two or three years ago that took some DL classes out of the Dawson School District. And our, um, I won't say who, because I don't know exactly who, but our neighbors weren't recommending our DL. They were mm -hmm. recommending they take courses down south somewhere, kind of thing. So I mean, our, so our relationship right, is usually really good, but... Yeah, it will it'd be interesting. What's new here, Bill, is that this com spirit of competition may turn uh, a little less friendly as there are 14 districts around the province competing for registrations. The biggest one in the north, by the way, is the e-bus out of Nechaco Lakes, and they've got hundreds and hundreds of students. David? Is Dawson Creek one of the, one of the centers? No. Yeah. They, they can only serve their own student population. Yeah. Do we know if they apply? I don't, I believe they did not apply. Any other questions related to distributed learning and becoming a poll? I love acronyms. Okay. Moving on in Stephen's report, human and social development, the volunteering at Peace Villa. Any questions, comments? Uh, careers and skill development, mind over metal. Okay, 
Okay. Support for Ukrainian students and families. And Poppy, that's the provincial outreach program for early childhood years, right? That's what that acronym stands for. You got it. Okay. Truth and Reconciliation, the North Peace Newsletter. Any questions or comments? And then TIG3 um, started with the celebration of French Immersion Week. And I don't have a draft to share with you tonight, but the city declared it as French Immersion Week. And I did talk to Stephen about sending a letter to the city to just say thanks for doing that and taking that big picture from the gym that Thomas was talking about and sharing that with the city as part of saying thank you. So we'll be looking to do that. If, if we do end up doing that, Helen, um, if I just mainly based on being the representative for Central, if I get an invite to come to that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, we were, well, we were just gonna, probably Thomas send them a letter and we would CC everybody on it. I wasn't thinking about presenting a picture, but I mean, that would be something that we could talk about. Ida? Actually, I kind of like the idea if uh, we sent someone to present it. At one okay. Of those. It, just, it just lets them know who we are as well. Yeah. Those okay. yeah. So I'll do the letter and the presentation and it was, um, we'll get the picture from Stephen and we'll get it printed and do something with it. Um, Heather Bellotti was the, is the president of the French Parents Association. That's not the right term, Stephen Help. Yeah, CPF, Canadian Parents okay. for French. Yeah. Canadian Parents for French. And it was Heather that went and asked for the week and then Central responded with stars and bells and had a wonderful week planned for the kids. So it was nice to see. Um, and it may be one of those things that we will see grow. So, all right. And we had the news there about RO and their breakfast and Jump Rope for Heart and Alwyn Holland's coding. Any comments, questions about any of those events? Moving on to the K-12 Anti-Racism Action Plan, which Stephen brought forward for you. Um, this was part of the partner liaison meeting, and I don't know, Stephen, if you can readily access it, but page 15 had an appendix and a timeline in it that in the session I was in, people went, because they already had some things that it looked like we were being expected to do in 22-23. Um, and that seemed to be a surprise to some of us. So I don't know if that's something you can comment on now or want to comment on later. I think regardless, we're all going to come back to this later. Uh, this is going to be, as you read in the letters of mandate, and we hear from our meetings that this is a big topic, and, and, and that's great. Um, we, we, of course, have a couple of things happening in the district already. Helen mentioned the equity scan. There, there definitely will be a sort of a focus here on uh, racism against in, Indigenous people as well in terms of this document. <clears throat> and just so trustees know, what we have in place and what our, our board has generally relied on is our, our codes of conduct around each of the schools, which has all of those items uh, that you you have to pay attention to in terms of discipline and in terms of what happens in a school environment. And so this will be, this document will be about consolidating uh, some of the things we have in curriculum, some of our codes of conduct, some of the pieces from the equity scan and sort of bringing it all together. So it'll actually involve all of us. In terms of the timelines, ministry is also, you know, being very understanding that this is not just a, you know, a one process, this will continue on. There were some some things mentioned in it that 
if they're really going to, with ministry support, get done in 2022, 2023, it was going to have to happen quickly because we're two thirds of the way through the school year almost. So, yeah, and, and as as we all know now, some sometimes these deadlines are a little bit aspirational. Um, but I think I think the 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 concept of bringing together a number of pieces around this uh, will be good work for all of us in the next uh, couple of years. Yep. All right. We have out of district field trip information that came forward from a number of schools. Um, could I get someone please to make a motion that the Board of Education adopt the out of district field trips for Charlie Lake, Clearview, Hudson's Hope, North Peace School as presented? Moved by Ida, seconded by David. Any discussion or questions around those trips? I appreciated the detail in the one from Hudson Hope where we knew exactly who was driving and how many kids they were carrying other than uh, their own students. I thought that was very thorough for us to have. So. All right, then, calling the question. All in favor? Moving on to number four, uh, community coaches that the Board of Education adopt the following community coach as presented. Ben Rosher for North Peace. Steve, would it be possible? Yes. Would it be possible? It's not a big deal, but if you stick with like beside the person's name, what they're coaching? Sure. Okay. Let's put that in the minutes there. And uh, and uh, then I might ask Leah to connect with um, Sharon on uh, making sure we ask for that information. Thank you. Just a lot of it. Like I said, I'm a sports council. And I if somebody all of a sudden wants to start, um, you know, karate or something, you know, like something totally new, right? Okay? I can bring it to them, let them know that we have interest. Yeah, it makes total sense, Bill. And it, thanks for the fresh eyes on that. All right. Mover and seconder, please. Moved by Bill, seconded by Thomas. Calling the question. All in favor? Okay. Moving on to item number five from Stephen's report. Um, could I please have somebody make the motion that the Board of Education adopt as a post of responsibility as presented for Alice Mondrell for the period of January the 25th to June 30th, 2023. What's the responsibility? So this is a poster responsibility at our middle school. Uh, for her, I believe it's in terms of the music um, department. Kind of the, I was thinking the same thing, right? When I was reading the both of them, that if, you know, if yeah. you, what they're responsible for kind of thing. Right? Fantastic. Let's well, do that too. Much. Yeah, good idea. Okay. I'm just making a note myself yep. to remember um then call could i have a mover and seconder please moved by bill seconded by david calling the question all in favor thank you all right we're moving on to the financial update and angela Okay, uh, thank you, Helen. Um, so we're starting off with a financial update to January 31st, 2023. Um, we submitted our enrollment projections um, for the upcoming 2023-24 um, and the two years uh, following. We submitted that on February 15th. Um, I have the HR support staff summary listed there, as well as the update to the trustee indemnity, indemnity for the 2023 year. And that is my report. Okay. 
So could I have a, please have a mover and a seconder for Angela's report? Moved by Bill, seconded by Thomas. And we'll go through item by item. Questions related to the finance update to January 31st. Again, it looked like they're right where they're supposed to be. There's nothing jumping out at me. Was yeah. there anything jumping out at you? No, it was, um, there was, um, so this is the annual budget. So we can't put the, uh, the per amended budget in here until hopefully we pass it later tonight. So um, you can see that the teacher's wages are, are higher as well as the, um, the PVP group and other professionals are above what they were projected because they now contain increases to date. So we're seeing we're seeing a bit of a disproportionate increase there. But um, by the time we get the amended figures in there, we should be good to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the enrollment projections. Yes. Yeah. Now, I have a massive amount of paper here, so bear with me while I shuffle. So enrollment projections, um, so the document that I provided is what we submitted to the, to the ministry on the 15th. Um, our numbers vary from the ministries quite a bit because <coughs> we used, um, you know, our in-house intel in the form of Jared Bell and Wade Hart and Angela Telford. And we use the, um, the paradigm shift, which is a program that we pay for to project the numbers. And we, our numbers were, were not similar to theirs. So we use the paradigm numbers as well as the, you know, the basic formula of add the projected Ks for this year subtract the grads and we came, that's how we came up with our brick and mortar numbers for September. Um, the distributed learning numbers we took, a, the numbers last year that were projected were based on us being one of the only polls. Like we, again, back to what Stephen was saying, we thought that there would be two or three and instead you get a poll, you get a poll, Every, everyone got a poll. So um, the numbers did not, what we tried to reflect last year was us being one of the only people who was getting it and that wasn't what happened. So the, for the next few years, we were budgeting um, more conservatively for um, distributed learning. Um, and then we met with, you know, the experts in the area for the special needs FTE um, Indigenous Education, Pat, uh, special needs would be uh, Keith McGillivray as well as Charmaine Pretchen for the ELL members. So again, this is our kind of our best estimate plus lots of conversations back and forth as to how we get these numbers and this is where we landed. So the minister, something of interest is that the ministry projects that our enrollment is going to drop in the next three years, which we also um, do see a drop in year three, but we don't see we don't see the drop next year. So there's a bit of a bubble that a grade nine bubble that will be that will be um, going out in the 2025-26 uh, year. So, but what I think becomes important with that is if we do know that there, we think the ministry's right around that the drop is it's a bit of a caution next year in terms of money because we may need a cushion if enrollment goes down. Yeah, the drop is for the, you can see it in the 2024, 25 yeah. and 25, 26. Next year, they actually projected higher than what, what we projected. Yeah. But based on our numbers and the paradigm and then the roll up, that is, where we were comfortable landing, so. Well, help me, last year we ended up sort of using the ministry's figure because they, 
they said sort of we had to, and it was higher than we th what we thought we were going to come in at. When they look at giving us our budget for 23, 24, will they use the figure that you've put in or will they use their own? No, no, they'll, they'll use my figures. Okay, yeah. thank you. And last year, the ministry projected for the 22, 23 school year, they projected uh, 6,034 and we ultimately came in at 59.74. So 60 higher than us or 70, we were 70 higher than our projection and yeah. they were 60 lower, which is, I, I would rather, if we're overstaffed, then we have an issue. If we're understaffed, we have an issue. So we have so an issue. There's a sweet it's, spot it's, to find. Yeah, it is. And I, I feel comfortable with the numbers we we put in this year. So oh, Stephen? To, to, to Helen's point, we try and uh, project conservatively uh, so that w we staff definitely want to fall on the side of um, having more students show up than we anticipated because then we can add a division if need be. But scaling back divisions in terms of the impact on students and, and around the district is not something we want to do. So we, we've been fairly conservative and, and quite frankly, more accurate than the ministry um, in, in that regard. So our recruiting team is going to hire 50 teachers with six kids per family, right? So we have 300 new kids? Yes. <laughs> I concur, Bill. If you can somehow make that happen, that would be great. Oh, no, that's not the recruiting team. What's that? That's the recruiting team. Oh, the recruiting team. Okay. <laughs> so I'll provide them with that direction tomorrow morning. <laughs> So that Any is, other questions related to the magical numbers that are going to drive all kinds of things? All right, moving on to trustee indemnity. Sorry, I, I just to back up for a second, I also included um, something that, that um, Jared had worked on, the projections and roll-ups. It kind of gives trustees an idea, um, yeah. just because we often hear um, from the community and that we need um, middle school. We need, we have a lot of students there that, and it's bursting, but um, is it, everyone have the documents? <laughs> so it kind of shows the reality of um, what the enrollment is at each of the, you know, the two, the middle school, the ELC and North Peace. And unfortunately, mine is not in um, color. I could pull it up, but if my memory serves, <laughs> it's the 26-27 year that thank you that is causing concern in in Burt Bowes. Yeah, it's red. It's red. So um, we we will share these projections with the ministry as well because we did put in that ask in the five year plan for those additions to to those schools. Um, yeah. Right now, for example, mm -hmm. um, at Dr. Kearney, mm -hmm. there's quite often four gym classes at a time in one gym. Camaraderie, I love it. <laughs> and it's cold, <laughs> it's cold in there. Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's cold. In the gym? No, no, outside of me. We're not supposed to set oh, up outside. certain temperatures. So, I mean, that's just you know, one example kind of thing. For sure. Okay. And that is one of the asks was an additional gym, gymnasium. And even like for uh, those schools. I have heard that some of the shop classes, uh, kids can't take them there mm -hmm. because you can only put so many people in there. Mm -hmm. For sure. There is definitely um, stress at the schools, but. Um, this this shows that we're not really in hot water at Burt Bowes until 2026, and then in, at Dr. Kearney until 2029. So it's it's just kind of sharing the story of what what's happening in our schools and what we project happening. So hopefully we'll be able to have an answer in place by by then. So yeah, I had a note to thank you for this, Angela, and then I almost blew by it. What I think is really interesting is that the nominal capacity of North Peace in the ELC 
we're nowhere close according to the graph for that. We definitely are for the other two, but we're not at the high school. So that was a bit of a, oh, for me. Yeah, there's, this is courtesy of uh, Jared. So I'm not going to take, take credit for it, but I will pass it along. Um, no. And then the other area that was highlighted was the French Immersion Program, which is showing, um, showing strong numbers pretty even, which is, uh, which is good. The school has the space for it now. It's, it's not, uh, doesn't seem to be, it has a little bit of growth, but it's pretty, pretty steady around 400, three, 390 to 400. Um, and then this is the paradigm projections uh, from 2022. So we take these into consideration when we do our 2020, um, our 2023-24 enrollment because it's we take these numbers and then we take our our intel for the through the district as well. So yeah, so that's something Jared provided us with and uh, useful document. I know I I enjoy looking at the at the front page with the, the roll-ups for the middle and second, secondary school, it does show me that we need to have a little bit of action um, occurring at those middle schools, but I can breathe easy, except for that kids are outside playing in the snow, so. Field hardiness. <laughs> David? I'm just thinking, is there any way to, to move the more senior, more advanced grade nines into the ELC? Um, but that's not I was just looking at the numbers there and, and yeah that's not something I, I can respond to um, they're they are set to 180 so if you look at the numbers they're pretty they're already pretty um, pretty full left down there I see that but mm -hmm. the, 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 the great tens some of the great tens could go up to 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 the to the big school and make room for some of the grade nines coming in. Coming into there. Yeah. Um, I, I can't, I can't. I, I'm not that. asking you to make Yeah, sure. just a suggestion to be joined. It's an excellent opportunity. To Steven? Yeah, all, all those scenarios get looked at by staff um, annually. The We forecast one of the greater pinch points to eventually be at the high school. So to move more grade 10s up to the main campus could be problematic there. Um, but, but, but just so you know, we, we've looked at models that include, you know, seven, eights and nines maybe at ELC or all kinds of different things. But right now we've discovered that there is room for what we need to do. We added capacity to Burpos in terms of not only those two portables, but also we retrofitted two classrooms at the key learning center. And uh, in, Three, year, three, four years ago, we added a couple of portables to Kearney as well. And as Bill pointed out, it's more about the uh, open or the common use spaces and facilities uh, that would be, we'd be looking at trying to expand. Uh, you'll also recall that when we opened up the two new middle schools, it was essentially with the same student population. And so the board has to always be aware of the cost of opening up a brand new school in terms of its utilities, uh, custodial, admin, um, with, the, uh, with the same number of students. So, so that's why we, you know, we have the expansions on our capital plan as opposed to a brand new school. Thank you, Stephen. Any further discussion related to this? It really is appreciated to see the, the background into, into the numbers. So thank you for that. Okay. So now can we move on to trustee indemnity, Miss Angela? Um, we, we could, but we missed the HR support staff summary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I missed that piece of paper. I'm, I'm cramped in my current location. No worries. Not your fault, my fault. 
we hear HR from yep. Angela. Yeah. We hear quite often if, or at least I do, mm -hmm. if there's all the TOCs are used, yeah, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Do we have many days where we have no relief for sports staff? Um, we definitely, prior to Christmas, we had issues with custodial as well as um, EAs, but we seem to be, we've managed to hire enough uh, casuals in the custodial area as well as EAs. We're having coverage in those areas. One reason why I'm asking because there's postings for jobs on there. For EAs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So that means, are they sitting empty right now? For the positions that are posted, if yeah, they haven't hired, if they, yeah. they could be pulling in, I, I can't tell you for sure, but they could be pulling in a casual to cover yeah. the needs of the school group in those scenarios. That just means the, the casual side. Kind of the EA casual? Yeah. Yeah. It, it would, but it's yeah. it's what we have to do oh, yeah. in order yeah, yeah. to keep the That's reality <laughs> but there isn't too many days uh from talking to londa that we're we have shortages in the ea we've managed to we changed our hiring practices and we've managed to get quite quite a solid pool of eas so um i was at a school the other day mm -hmm. and the comment was if one person phones in sick after lunch Stephen had to come and teach because there was no teachers. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and I did. I'm still trying to get in as a TOC, but they just won't take me. You agree? It's a little hurtful, but that, that's fine. This is different. Because you're not busy enough, enough Angela. Because you're not busy enough. But it would fill my cup to go to where I see what happens right now. Yeah. That's okay. If I wide enough, to pick me up on it. So right now we are seeing good coverage. Good. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Stephen. I'll just just so uh, the yeah the EA casual coverage is is definitely shoring up. I can confirm that we have uh, ongoing shortages that do take place for 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 on the teaching side, and that you know EAs are then pulled into those classrooms. And so, um, you know, I, I don't want to have a report cre created every month, but as you know, we do come back from time to time with the number of days that we ran short, and we'll continue to do that. Even if that happened, I don't know, three or four times a year, it would be fine. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Angie, you look like you're searching for something. I'm ready for you, Helen. Okay. All right. Under governance, trustee indemnity. Oh. I had my papers all mixed up. Angela's got hers straight now. Thank you. Um, so we are revisiting policy 1008, trustee indemnity. And in order to um, calculate the increases starting January 1st of, of the current year, we went to the CPI. And as we all know, with inflation, we're seeing um, increases You'll hear all about inflationary pressures in my amended budget presentation, but this is um, the CP, the consumer price index is what governs the trustee indemnity. So um, as of December 2020, from December 2021 to 2022, the average is 6.6% for all items. So that <laughs> Uh, calculation leads to a 6.6% minus the 1% or a 5.6% increase effective January 2023. So that is um, the trustee indemnity. So you can see the proposed rates for trustees is 14,791. Uh, vice chair is 16,797 and the chair is at 18,488. And those will be paid retroactive to January.
Thomas. Um, just a quick question, because this is my first time seeing the, this particular change. This is the same thing that happens every other year. We're not reinventing the wheel with the with the calculations or anything along those lines. This is no. pretty standard stuff. This is this is the policy. Yeah. We changed the policy last year just to add um, in the event of a negative decrease amount. That was the only kind of change that that's been noted. But this year we definitely are not in that scenario. So. And I mean, in reality, it's like sixty dollars before taxes, kind of thing a month. Ida, yeah, just a little history, Thomas. We went to a policy on this because prior to having this policy, it was really contentious about whether we took a raise or we didn't take a raise or something. And once we've gone to this, it's just fairer. It's keeps us up to with the rest of the province and it just works way better than trying to figure it out every year. So, so that's just the history of it because before we used to just try to figure out what we should do every year. And we get a set rate where there's other areas that if you attend a back meeting, you get a bonus. Yeah. If you go to school for a meeting, you get a bonus. Okay. And then Angela's sitting there trying to figure out all the bonuses and stuff and you know, so it's a lot easier to. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't you that. No, no, it's not like it. No. Trustee Witten is going to rock the boat. <laughs> no, I was going to say, and, and I think what we've found is when you look across the province, other districts that don't have it in policy that are trying to come up with a what is a fair base rate, it becomes quite contentious. We certainly aren't the highest. We're not the lowest. I think we're somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So in comparison right now, that salary of, uh, of, of the 14,000 is, is pretty much in the middle of the rest of the school districts where we're yeah. at. I haven't looked this year, but when I looked a couple of years ago, it was. Yeah. You, you should be getting the result, the answers to that. We just filled, um, the districts had to fill, have to fill out um, a trustee survey, indemnity survey. So the res it's, I believe it's due beginning of March. So that information should be. One or two that are off the grid kind of thing, like different. Oh, okay. Um, I can't remember which one it is. You might, that they get the same as the lowest paid elected official for the city. Okay. And last time I looked, I think it was like 32 or something kind of thing, but it's, it's one of the bigger centers. Yes, sir. Right. Any further discussion related to this? Then calling the question related to Angela's report, all in favor of accepting her report. Thank you. Bill's voting double. All right. Moving on to item number 10, reports of the regular committee of the whole meeting of February the 6th, 2023, which is pages 19 and 20 in your agenda package. Could I get a mover and seconder for those minutes, please? Moved by Thomas, seconded by Bill. Any errors or omissions? All right, all in favor? Carried by everybody. All right, business arising from the minutes. Angela. Or Stephen, did you want to talk, have anything to bring back on improved communication options between the schools and trustees? Just um, if I can, Helen, 
Yep. That the uh, we we talked about it at our last DLTM. We're looking at a couple of different options around by, via email as far as newsletters right from my ed. Or Jared is also looking at a way to consolidate all of the information uh, into one place automatically. So we're pursuing uh, a way to, to beef up that communication. Okay, thank you. And we did have a reach out from Alan Holland, Melody Braun. Um, just before the meeting, I sent you the draft of the letter to Dawson Road Maintenance with a note that if you wanna send me any feedback, I'm happy to have it and then figure out where we want to CC it to. I didn't have a chance to run it by Angela ahead of the meeting, so I still need her input. So, Alan, um, yep. Also, on the communication, I also had one of the schools, the website on their website, their Facebook and stuff was wrong, so they showed me the right one to go to, and then it had all the information. So, hmm. some of it's just so once I talked to the school, they said, oh, yeah, no, that's the old one. This is our new one. And it just had one little thing different, and then their calendar popped right up. Okay. Well, that's and, good um, to know. Just, you know, I've had two of my schools in the past week approach me and say, how can we communicate better? And offer to send me out, like, a newsletter once a week. The one, yeah. they, the one they do with their teachers, more or less. Yep. Okay. Well, I, I can tell you that I've been somewhat um, forceful about the need to figure this out. Well, it seems like it's got across. You've rocked. You've rocked. Okay. Ellen, Any further business Thomas. related to that? Thomas. Thomas. Um, the, the only thing, just reading over the... Uh, the letter to the minister here. Um, it reads like we're saying the transportation department needs or is saying this, and it doesn't sound like we're taking onus and saying yes, we believe as well that the transportation department needs to be taken seriously in this concern. Um, okay. Stronger so, wording. That says that we support it. Okay. Other than that, that's great, Helen. Thank you. I'll send it out again. I, I, I knew it wasn't my best effort. Okay. Great. Moving on to item 10.3 policy committee. where we're looking at a notice of motion going out for policy 5005 criminal records where we've added in the word trustees, recognizing that this is something we are wanting to do uh, and have followed up. So could I have a mover to put this Policy 5005, criminal records out for notice of motion. I don't know who's jumping the most. I see Ida, so I'm going to go with Ida. Okay. Moving on. BCSTA Trustee Gillis, who will be going to Provincial Council. She does have some things that she'll bring up in camera. I don't think there's anything in public, but go ahead, Nicole, if I'm wrong about that. Well, there's just, uh, there's just, I guess, is it in camera, then the motions that are going to come forward, that's an in camera yep. item? Okay, yeah, yep. then I can't think of anything in public. Nope. Okay, so moving on to 11.2, we have attached um, the resolution that was approved at BCPC AGM that we brought forward related to recruitment and retention. Um, it now becomes a public record because it's passed and it's through all the processes. So 
Moving on to April 17th and the BCPC regional meeting, I do know that there have been requests made to BCPC from our neighbor to the south, south piece, that a Zoom option for this meeting be made available. I haven't heard yet whether they've done that, but um, Julianne Runge has been asked to approach as the president of the NIB and the BC, BCPC reps have been also asked to approach BCPC. So we'll stay tuned for further information on that. Okay. And then Pro-D will be the advance and Stephen and I will get, get something out. We have to kind of be in the same place, I think. We thought we would work on it at Partner Liaison and it was so busy on other stuff that we had a, a brief conversation, so. Okay. Moving on to the amended annual budget bylaw, which I have to find for a minute. Okay. And I'm assuming this is where we get our budget presentation, Angela. Yes. <coughs> All right. Le Leah's gonna share her screen. Usually it doesn't matter. I saw it, and then it, it decided to run away. I will be presenting the amended annual budget for the 22-23 uh, school year. The budget is based on spending trends that we're seeing, um, inflationary in increase adjustments that um, we have become aware of in the current year. We are using the September 2022-1701 count as the basis for funding, and we have adjusted the distance distributed learning uh, enrollment that we projected as we are not seeing it come to fruition for the February and uh, May count. Uh, you'll see those adjustments in the revenue data. So um, this is just the journey we will be taking tonight. Uh, just our agenda for the evening. I'm not going to go through it because we're going to see it live in a couple of seconds. So. Next. So the funding component, as you can see, we are coming in um, at less projected. So we have less projected, but we have um, more overall money, which is kind of a different stance, but I'm, I'm going to explain it. So we had an increase of 17 FTE in the brick and mortar schools, um, but the online learning numbers that were uh, projected for, in our last year's count um, did not did not occur. So we have a decrease um, in DL of 139 FTE, and that's over September, May, and February, September, February, and May counts. Um, so the 139 FTE decrease and the increased brick and mortar of 70 leads to a net decrease of 69 FTE, which is reflected here. 
Um, we have included the funding decrease for DL for February and May in our amended budget projections uh, in revenue. Uh, the decrease is re reflecting a 79 um, FTE for the May, the May February periods. Um, yeah, so those are what our budget and staffing, that's what everything is paid based on is the, that amended budget FTE. Thank you. Uh, so this is the Ministry of Education and Child Care Funding. So this is outside of the special purpose funds. This is the operating funds that are provided to us. Uh, we have the enrollment base number up at the top of 47. Million nine hundred forty-four five hundred and eleven. We have special education at seven point six million, ELL at eight hundred sixty-three thousand eight hundred twenty-five, Aboriginal education at one point nine million, and adult education at twenty-four thousand five twenty-one. Those are um, those numbers are based on the numbers submitted in the 1701 September count. But some other areas of interest are the salary differential, which is um, provides additional funding to districts with higher than average teacher salaries. So we, we get 913,000 from the ministry for those reasons. Uh, the unique geographic factor is based on considerations such as climate, remoteness, sparseness, and low enrollment. Um, so that's the unique ge geographic factor and we get 9.9 .9 million from the ministry for that. Uh, the BC education plan is $9 per FTE based on the previous September enrollment. Uh, the equity of, op of opportunity settlement funding is funding to support additional services uh, to students that are in care don't and don't have assessments done or have other adversities um, that they deal with that we uh, we consider. So this is comes to 235,000. Um, and then after that is just the other funding windows for DL, the February May count and then the summer summer learning which brings us to total ministry funding for 22-23 of 70,759,203. So you'll notice that there's no change in the DL funding here, but we'll see it. Um, it's, this is what, how the ministry likes it presented and we'll see the adjustment further on in the revenue. Angela, <coughs> when we did some work previously, we did not get an increase in the base enrollment per pupil funding, but there was a small increase in special ed, wasn't there? Uh, no, there was flat. Was flat in special ed too? Yeah. Okay. There was no changes to any of the funding amounts for, they, they were identical to 20, uh, 21, 22 for 22, 23. Thank you. I've, I've been dealing with the claim of otherwise on another front. So thank you for confirming that. Angela, the equity one there, opportunity student settlement. Yep. Is that so much for student or I know one you said earlier was nine dollars a student. Is that so much a student or how does that work? Um, I don't exactly know how that one works. They just I can definitely look it up and get back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No remote kind of area kind of thing. Right, we have to bring people in. And... For goodness sakes, I just had, the, had it in front of me. Are you talking, you're speaking to the equity of opportunity settlement amount? That's the ones that aren't, um, you said that didn't have a designation yet? All right. Um, it's not necessarily like we don't, they may not need assessments. They may just have some difficulties in school. Yeah. So they just provide that buffer so that we can have additional EA time or we can have additional counseling time. So that, that would also include what the ones that have been assessed yet? Um, they, 
they, I guess it would in a way, the ones that are waiting for for assessment, but they they don't get a number from us for that. So it's just a general, yeah. they have a, a formula that they must, they base it on our current enrollment and, and come up with a number. I can definitely get back to you with how it's calculated if you're interested. Yeah, it's just kind of like because so for the more centralized places have that availability and don't have to bring in people where we do still have to bring in people and it's expensive for us. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is just um, because we're in Northern District. I think it's something that is open to all yeah. districts. So. Good. Thanks. Very good. I have a quick question on the second to last line, the summer learning. Yeah. Um, went from 67 down to 896. Mm -hmm. um, any reasoning in particular? I know it's the ministry side, but do you have any insight into why? No, that, no this is based on the numbers that we, we give them. So um, last we projected that we would get, I, I don't have the FTE in front of me. Uh, I do actually. Did, we had at one point, um, distance learning was running some summer programming and I don't know that they did last year. I guess when I looked at it, I thought that was what the difference was. Well, they, they did have some enrollment in there, but not what they had anticipated coming into play. But so there was, um, yeah, some students, but not as many as they thought. And again, the annual is based on what they projected would come in the summer. And the summer learning is who actually showed up in this case. Great, I, I love the question. Um, now I, I have to use, okay, here we are. And this is our uh, operating revenues that we're estimating um, to the end of the year. So the Ministry um, of Education and Child Care, that is that comes from the ministry. There's no no changing that that number. Um, pay equity as well is a ministry uh, number. The funding for graduated adults. That is what we are expecting. We we never know. We could get additional once the February and May count come in, but thirty nine thousand is pretty standard to what we've seen the last few years. Uh, the student transportation fund. I think we did a. Uh, deep dive into this one, and we haven't seen a change since 2016. So that's just 425, 785 is what we are grateful to get from the ministry. Uh, the it support staff benefit grant, we didn't know it at preliminary budget time, but we know now that it's 68,232. FSA score grant, uh, pretty static at 8187. Uh, the the early learning framework implementation the ministry likes to see, and that one is $991. We didn't know it at preliminary budget. Uh, we know that the wage increases uh, for teachers excluded and exempt is coming in at 1.9 million, 1.925098. So this, this line with the negative 354, that's where we're reflecting the decrease in enrollment for distance learning for February and May. Um, MCFD, the school age therapy program is at 127,502. Uh, international out of province is coming in at 744,289. Uh, miscellaneous income, we've estimated to come in at 317, close to our projection. Um, Rentals and leases, no change there, 101,000. And the good news story of the year for me is the investment income is <laughs> anticipated to come in at 320,000. When we did the budget last year, we were getting, for the last two years prior to that, <coughs> 80,000. But with the rise in uh, interest rates, there is some reflection in the investment income. Not good on a mortgage front, but I'm happy to see it in. Uh, our district. So that um, 320,000 offsets some of the inflationary pressures that we are we are seeing. So um, you've note, probably noted that we're not have not received the amount for the QP increase. 
um, we're told that that will come in March. So that money for now has to come out of surplus. Any questions? Oh. Yeah, Helen probably can't see your hand, so. No, I can't. Yeah, okay. sorry. Um, Just speak, speak up. up. Yeah. Speak, speak up. out. Yes. Do we still, I don't think we do, but do we still own any properties? Like um, housing? No, we don't own housing. We own land. Okay. We used to own housing. That's why. Okay. Just checking. We have one inventory piece of um, property in town. And then I think we have one in Hudson Hope as well. Do we still have one in Pitt Mountain Way? Or is that gone? Do we have one there? Or Thank you, that? Leah. Yes, we do. Very good. Can you just give me an example of what miscellaneous income is or where it comes from? Um, miscellaneous income. This magic pulp. <laughs> I can't. I'll, I'll take three of those. <laughs> what was that? Sorry. There were magic cauldron somewhere. You just keep pulling. Cauldron. Would a small example of that be like if somebody wants to rent one of our buses, or not? Uh, that does go in there. Yes. Thank yes. you, Bill. And then thing um, donations that we receive go into miscellaneous, unless they're specifically targeted for a project. Um, I wish I had some sort of waiting music. The elevator music. Yes, something <laughs> along those lines. Um, yeah, it's pretty pretty much like it ranges from any money we receive for like say the the sale of a small a small asset like right here or recycling of our steel. Um, there's money that we, any money we receive that we, like the, the air show, for example, for the bus usage, so that that's one. Um, the ICBC refund we put in here that we receive. Any funds we receive, um, we don't offset them to the expense account because that adjusts the expenses that we were projecting, so. It's, Sounds good. That's, yeah. Okay. I was just kind of curious. I wasn't sure where that was coming from. So. so that's that one. One thing that I would mention, I would like to see, and I don't know if this reflects everybody's, is a breakdown of what is a donation, what was actually donated versus the income. So how much is actually just coming in from donation? Okay. We can do that, Tom. Okay, where were we at? Next slide. This is just a pie chart that some people like. I don't know. Some people don't. But we can see that the majority of our revenue comes from the Ministry of Education and Child Care at 98.02%. A visual to see how it kind of uh, dominates, which it should. Okay, this is um, uh, just comparing our different operating expenses by function, which you would expect instruction is the largest one because that is um, reflecting of our strategic goal to um, keep education at the forefront. There's minor variances in the uh, the percentages, but the and the but the overall increase in spending is still quite aligned with the preliminary budget. We're seeing uh, transportation numbers went went up substantially, so that's quite a, quite a variance there. But the instruction, the district administration, and we're seeing a slight decrease in operations and maintenance, which I'll speak to in a second. Um, but the instruction increases in the amended budget are reflecting uh, wage increases for teacher exempt and AOs. 
and the proposed wage increases for QP are also included in there. Uh, some of the areas that we're seeing with, with the additional 70 uh, enrolled students, we had to do a per student allocation increase for schools, so that's reflected in here. Um, we are seeing on our technology purchases, which are included in the instruction um, function, we're seeing increases in uh, inflationary increases as well as the shipping costs are, are increasing, so that's reflected in here. Um, sorry, let me get to my notes here. So those, the instruction did not largely can be explained with wages. We did also see, um, we did include the portable move in here because it's coming, will be coming out of surplus this year. And um, any other changes to, for example, the local table allocations for QP are included in here. That's that $128,000 that we bargained and um, you'll, you'll see it, a, a bit of it comes into play here. And we're seeing increases in uh, TOC costs and in the casual EAs that are up from the previous year or from the previous budget. Okay. Uh, district administ administration, again, we are seeing uh, wage increases, plus we had a hire after we did the preliminary budget, so that's reflected in those numbers as well. Um, but all the rest of the, <coughs> this is not a, a huge supply area, so those, those costs stayed quite static, so largely it could be due to uh, wage increases as well as increases, we're seeing increased travel back to pre-COVID amounts, people going to more conferences and, and uh, whatnot. Uh, moving on to operations, we, Again, we're reflecting the overall wage increases. We're um, seeing increases in our safety program because we've purchased a safety program now. So we have some new software in play and um, we are seeing overall increases in the custodial supplies, largely due to supply chain issues that we've had. We had to discontinue um, one supplier and moved to another, which then required increases to chemical dispensers. So that's all reflected um, in there. And then we're, we've, we're projecting an overall increase from the previous year of 200K, which, um, and then in operations and maintenance, we're also uh, budgeted for a switch from our current um, garbage system to uh, contracting it out because we have very old trucks and they are expensive to replace. So we've done a bit of cost analysis that we're currently working on, but I think that's the direction uh, we'll go and then put it out to tender. So we've, we've included those costs in here. Either way, they're going to occur. We're going to buy a new truck or we're going to contract out. So um, those are represented in there. Also of note in uh, custodial is a decrease in the casuals for um, the grounds as well as for the custodial casuals. The custodial casuals, because we're back to pre-COVID where we have the ratio for cleaning, we're back to that. Plus, we also couldn't find any prior to December, so um, that unfortunately or fortunately led to a bit of a savings there. And then um, we're seeing a decrease in the casual usage by the facilities department as they made an additional hire. And then um, we're, we're not needing them for the snow removal because we haven't had that, that rough of a winter. So there's some savings there. Um, did you just say yet? That's not part of my presentation. I, <coughs> I can't speak to the weather. Um, uh, for transportation, there is there is a substantial increase there. So 
we are having our current bus drivers, uh, we, again, in the local, um, the local dollars in year one, the bus drivers are getting a dollar twenty-five per hour increase. That's reflected in this budget, and um, we're also seeing we do have some casuals. The casuals are getting used as opposed to hiring, at our, because there's some routes we can't hire for, and we're using the casuals there. So we're seeing an increase in casuals. We're also seeing an increase in bus drivers as something that's kind of shown up is the after COVID we've really gotten back to um, field trips. So we're using our current bus drivers to go go out on field trips, which is a great thing, but also uh, <coughs> the overtime as adds to the district um, the, the district wages so. The other thing we're anticipating for this year is we're wanting to purchase GPS for um, the buses as well as for our facilities fleet. And then a route management software system. So those are also um, put in these into the amended budget. Uh, we're seeing quite the increase in fuel. Um, from the pre preliminary versus the amended, an increase of roughly $300,000. Um, and then just in regular fuel, we're seeing a $16,000 um, increase as well. So those are the operating expenses by function. Bill. Bill. You mentioned oh, something Bill. about a portable move to where? 101. We, we discussed that in putting yep. in um, the uh, after grade six out there, so seven to nine, and including some grade tens out there. We, At my age, I forget some things. Pardon me? I forget some things. That's fine. I'm here to remind you. Not a problem. <laughs> Anything else? Just a quick one on the so previously you mentioned. <laughs> $9.9 million that the ministry was funding to us based on our geological landscape, if you will, um, the large area that we cover, gas, all of that kind of stuff. How often is that renegotiated? So my question goes back to, okay, our fuel costs just increased by $400,000. Are they going to take that into account in the next year's budget? No, they, they don't take a look at it again. Um, Again, I might be able to help here, but the the transportation dollars that they've given us have not increased since 2016. So the way they do it is a calculation um, for your furthest location from the board office. So unless we move our board office somewhere remote, we will not see an increase in that transportation funding. And I I don't believe anything to do with the fuel price, the fuel costs are included in the unique geographic factors. And, and just, the history of it, previous, they used to give you the actual costs the next <coughs> year, but then they went to this um, transportation allocation and our board, we've really tried to get you them know, to look at how we put more money into transportation. And we really fought hard to try to get them to look at going back to something, but we weren't very successful at all. And it's it's like some districts don't even want to bus, but they get more busing funding than we do. But it's because of where they are from their, from their board office, so. We did, we did advocate in the we standing advocated, committee yes. this year again. They seem to take some notice, but. Um, I don't believe there's, there won't be any changes to funding this year, and I, I can't speak to what we'll see next year. Okay. But we are advocating and, regularly yeah. to make changes to that. And the unique geographic features, um, it was upped as part of the funding formula review, but I don't think there was anything built into how it got topped up as needs continued, but 
we did end up with more in there at one time than we'd anticipated and we were quite excited about it. Um, it did allow us to keep run Buick when it hadn't been open the year before. So we didn't get funding for it. So it has helped us at times. Helen? Yep. To Thomas's question, there is a funding, there is a committee. I don't know how often they convene. I know they are, they are convening now in terms of this spring and it involves a number of different stakeholders. They call it the Funding Equity Committee. I just know about it because at one point there was going to be a backup on it, but that, that changed. In any case, uh, they, they do come back from time to time to look at the formulas that drive all of these allocations. That would be something that it would be interesting to know what the regional representation on it is. It is not in our favor. Okay. <laughs> Follow up. Um, and again, just a visual pie chart. Um, you can see that. I've gone off script, people. You're in trouble. Um, we, we can see that the majority of the uh, expenses within the district does align with our strategic goals of putting money into education at 77%. Uh, percent. Here we are. Operating expenses, this is just another visual. Um, you can see that our largest expense is uh, salaries and benefits, which are 84% of our, um, our total costs, and then services and supplies at roughly 16%. Um, again, just a just a pretty pie chart, just showing that the what we spoke to earlier, eighty four percent for salaries. Okay, this is our schedule two summary. As I'm sure, we we can move on to the actual um, amended budget, but this is coming from schedule the schedule two summary. It shows the total revenue minus the total expenses, which puts us at uh, net revenue of 873,877 loss. And that's, and then we um, add in the tangible capital assets, which shows that we are pulling 1.5 million from surplus. Now, roughly 670,000 of that is um, increases, uh, the QP increases, which we can't, which we have to reflect in this current budget is coming out of surplus because we don't know the number. So that's how the ministry would like us to present it. <coughs> um, the rest of the money for the accumulated surplus, we're seeing um, an inflationary contingency in there. Just we have in our uh, accumulated surplus from last year, we did project that there would be a portion coming from um, the surplus for in inflationary contingencies, and we're seeing that occur. There are some purchases that um, did not make it to last year because of the supply chain issues. So we're seeing roughly 130, 140,000 for. Um, some purchases that should have come out of last year's budget, but came out of this year's, but we knew that they were coming. Um, the GPS and the portable move are going to be coming out of surplus. And then there's different um, educational in initiatives, the map, literacy, learning support model. Um, we put some money aside for um, library purchases as well as an SEL worker. So. Those, those are still on track to be spent. 
Okay, the special purpose funds. Um, in the budget document, you can see we have 24 funds. Uh, 19 of them are for the Ministry of Education and Child Care, and it's different branches. So you can see that there are quite a few new ones this year, um, most of them being um, for the child care um, branch of the ministry. So the basically just before um, early care and learnings and then um, they're, they're all mixed up here. This changing results for young children, seamless day we did see last year, but um, we did see quite a few new ones relating to child care, which is expected because we became the Ministry of Education and Child Care last April. Um, now you'll know you'll notice or you may notice that there was a dollar left over in the strong start um, that wasn't on purpose to see if you were there it was just an error on my part i saw it today when i reviewed again and i did not want to read all the documents because the trickle down effect of that one dollar um it just affected everything it would move through the whole the whole uh, amended budget documentation as well as the presentation. So I left it in there and I'm sure I will get teased for it from the ministry and from any of my peers that see it. So not a not a great news story, but I'm I'm owning up to it. So um, is there any questions on the special purpose funds? Any questions about what special purpose funds are? Thomas is a new trustee. Those are. I don't want to slow it down too too much. Um, yeah, but one question is mental health in schools. Do you elaborate on what that program is specifically, or where that money's going to? It's a low number. I, I think it's a low number. We get funded fifty-two thousand dollars per year to, um, and Carlene Andrews is in charge of that particular fund. She used it to support. Uh, different initiatives in schools. Um, and then Angela? Pays for staffing. Yes. So it, it, that's a bit of it's, it's actually a supplement they've added in. It does not reflect the only allocation that is used for social and emotional learning. In fact, the 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 bulk of our community link fund that you see on there of 734-207 is, is used in various capacities for that kind of support. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, and then that brings us to the budget statement bylaw, which shows that um, operating expenses are seventy-five thousand five or seventy-five seventy-five million five hundred ninety-eight thousand six hundred fifty-seven. Um, Tangible capital purchases are roughly 700,000. Special purpose funds, uh, 11,464,588. And then the capital funding expenses are 59,836.48. So this just shows what the total, what the different pots are to, sh to give us our total expenditures for the year. So they come from the special purpose fund, the capital fund, which is largely made up of, of the asset amortization, and then the operating total expenses. And that is my presentation. And now- Right, further questions, to Thomas. Um, just a, more of a comment. Um, I was really happy to see the investments paying off in a time where everything kind of hit the roof and the new expenses are going to be rough with gas and um, all of that kind of stuff. That was a nice little offset. That so, was a good I'm, I'm, for me. absolutely. Good job. Well, I didn't really. <laughs> good job of making a double it work for us. <laughs> no pressure, sure. I'll, I'll take that challenge on. 
Anything? Any other questions? Some somewhere yeah. the road. Mm -hmm. Could you get the numbers for uh, like if students come here from a different district, hey, compared to the Alberta students? Students from a different, you mean migration like from other districts? Fort Nelson comes here, a student comes because they want to take advantage of our speed skating mobile. Do they have to pay so much to go to school? Or UConn, for example. You know what I mean? Oh, I got you. Okay, I can um, see that. Generally, I, that, that might be difficult to get unless Stephen has some insight into that. Because they generally would move here and get enrolled. Yeah. But if they're so from out of province, from a, okay. kind of the, you know what I mean? Just them. Okay. I've had the comment um, through hockey that mm -hmm. the Yukon kids don't come here anymore mm -hmm. because they get charged uh, several thousand dollars to come to school here. Yeah, they, they do. To, um, yeah, they, so. River, for example, I think Thompson River doesn't charge them. Okay. I think so they save like eight grand a year or something like that. I can't remember that I've heard. Go ahead, Stephen. We, uh, you put your district at risk if you do not enroll kids as per the ordinarily resident uh, rules. And if other districts are doing that then, and they're audited, they'll have to pay all that money back. The family has to live, the family has to live in the catchment or it has to be a child in, in care in order to qualify for funding. And Thompson Rivers is an online. No, no, Thompson Rivers, River, like the, the, the area. Oh, okay. Cam Kamloops Thompson. Yeah, I, I don't know about them. All I know is that a few years back, we had to clean that up here. Yeah. And we are actually going through an audit. It's in my in-camera topic. But our, uh, but we have to, the, the family has to be, and the student needs to be ordinarily resident. In terms of your other question around getting stats, if my ed or my ed uh, student system information system allows us to uh, extract that, we can look at that. But otherwise, we would not have time to go through and create a new report on that. Just a dollar, like, is there a dollar figure we charge or no? Or we just don't let them come anymore? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, anyone that is not ordinarily resident has to pay the fees. Yeah. And Mr. Campbell has all those fees. It's in approximately, I believe, $5,000 to $6,000 for the year. Okay. All right. So can I get... Um, a mover and a seconder for the first reading of the bylaw. And then we'll get a mover and seconder to do the next. Well, first of all, I need a, mo a move, mover that all three readings of the amended annual budget bylaw 2022-2023 will be given at this meeting. So can I get a mover and a seconder for that? Moved by David, seconded by Thomas. All right. We're going to do the three readings. All in favor of that, please. Carried. So we have the mo the motion's been moved and carried that in accordance with section 68.4 of the school act all three readings of the amended annual budget will be given at this meeting now i need a mover and a seconder to adopt the first reading of the amended annual budget bylaw i think okay mover and seconder moved by david seconded by ida and we will proceed with the first reading being in full. This is the amended annual budget bylaw, a bylaw of the Board of Education of school, school District Number 60, Peace River North, called the Board, to adopt the amended annual budget of the Board for the fiscal year 2022-2023 pursuant to Section 113 of the School Act, 
RSBC 1996 C412 as amended from time to time called the act. The board has item one, the board has complied with the provisions of the act, ministerial orders and ministry of education and child care policies respecting the amended annual budget adopted by this bylaw. This bylaw may be cited as school district number 60 Peace River North amended annual budget bylaw for the fiscal year 2022-2023. Point number three, the attached statement two showing the estimated revenue, revenue and expense for the 2022-2023 fiscal year and the total budget bylaw amount of $93,746,893 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year was prepared in accordance with the act. Statement 2-4 and Schedules 1-4 to four are adopted as the amended annual budget of the board for the fiscal year of 2022-2023, read this first time on the 21st day of February 2023. Okay. Right. Could I have a motion that the second and third readings be done in short form? Moved by Ida, seconded by Thomas, right? Because you have a written copy in front of you, it gets to be short, all right? This is the, we'll do the second reading now. The This is the amended annual budget. Um, a bylaw of the Board of Education of School District Number 60, Priest River North. It's coming from section 113 of the school act and the boards complied with all the things we need to do in preparing the order. The boy, board bylaw may be cited by school district number 60 and the attached statement two shows that we are, to, are proving uh, the amount of $93,746,893 and dollars for the 22-23 fiscal year. And statement 2-4 and schedules 1-2-4 are adopted as the am amended annual budget of the board. Okay. So can I have a motion to accept the second reading of the amended budget bylaw? Moved by Thomas, seconded by David. Moving on to the third and final reading of the amended annual budget bylaw, it's a bylaw of the Board of Education of School District Number 60, Peace River North, to adopt the amended annual budget. It is governed by Section 113 of the School Act. The board's complied with everything we need to do in preparing the order. The board can cite this as the an amended annual budget bylaw for the fiscal year 2022-2023. Our attached statement two shows the estimated revenue and expense for the year will be $93,746,893 with for the 2020-23 fiscal year. Statement two, four and schedules one to four are adopted as the amended annual budget of the board. Could I please get a mover and a seconder for the third and final reading of the amended annual budget? Moved by Bill, seconded by Ida. So that's done. Thank so Angela, I will be back in town on Saturday. Hopefully signing that stuff on Monday will work for you. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to area item number 13, correspondence. I don't have any. Unfinished business. I don't think we have any. And under new business, item number 15, we put in recording of meetings. So although we've been recording meetings and telling people that we're recording them. Um, I don't know that they're actually making it to the website. So um, I will say that at the partner liaison meeting, there was, they, they paired us up and I was supposed to be an experienced board chair, which I thought was quite funny. 
And I spent a lot of time with this woman from Cowichan who had just had a blowout at her board meeting and they were going to move to not having public and move to recording. Um, public could zoom in to attend meetings and then what they had found is because they recorded meetings and had no way of screening and taking inappropriate materials out of the recording, um, they had themselves in trouble. So there was an aspect of recording of meetings that was ca causing people some concerns and there also was concerns related to live people at meetings. And I just went, well, I can't help you with any of that because I've never had to experience that as a board chair where you had to throw people out of the boardroom essentially and provide escorts for your trustees. So again, I came away being fairly thankful, but there's an awful lot of thinking around recording and should we be and should we po be posting it. So that's why we're talking about it now. Thomas. So my opinion is any way that we have even a possibility of getting out to more people for them to see what we do here on a regular basis is valuable. Um, even if one person is clicking on the link to go take a look at it, I think there is an absolute value in having the recordings. Maybe we're not using them to their full potential right now. Maybe sharing them out on the Facebook page, stuff like that will bring more attention to them and frankly, bring more people to hear to have their discussions. Um, with the concerns of having live people at the meetings, one of the guys that was speaking at that, the trustees training seminar said that when somebody wants to speak, they have to put in their request 24 hours beforehand yeah. and they have to talk on a topic that is specifically being talked about at that meeting. And there's no other options. Um, that's kind of how they handled it. I think the recording, um, I, I think it's valuable. I haven't utilized it a whole ton, um, but I do think there is value in it. I, I think part of what we found at, with the live streaming of meetings during COVID, they were hardly watched at all. And when you looked at the expense of having staff on site to do that live streaming, it, it was felt not to be worth it at that point in time. I can't tell you what the stats are on accessing anything meeting wise that we put up on, I think we put them up on YouTube. Ida? I agree with Thomas that if it's, it's no cost to us to record these meetings and have them posted. And as far as contentious situations and being the board chair lots of times we have them, but we have such good protocols in our district that we're not going to run into a problem where we're going to have to have somebody escorted out and like we we would stop it before it got that far so well and that was part of no problems with recording our meetings and the public seeing us as well a, and that was partly what i thought the way our agendas are set up you can't just come in and have an open forum to expound. Whereas some of the boards, they have just an open public conversation partway through their meeting. And that's where things got derailed. The problems. Yeah. You know, I've been in meetings where we've had somebody give us a presentation that was not what was supposed to be presented on. But as a board, we adjusted and we did fine. Yeah, Stephen. Staff are happy to reflect whatever the wish of the board is in terms of re recording them or not. Um, I also have heard among colleagues just when the, when there is a video out there, you you can't take it back. So sometimes they can be taken out of context, but that's just that's just the risk of doing you know business as a government organization. Um, and I think if if there's also then an understanding that our definitive our definitive information are the notes from the meetings. I think only you can, can you expand on that last point a little bit, Stephen, please? Oh, just, I guess if there were, and, and again, we don't, as we've all pointed out, 
we have really good protocols in terms of what gets put on the agenda and in terms of how the meetings are run. What I mean by the, is that the meeting minutes, uh, the public, if they're looking for something, that would be the definitive source of decisions and information that reflects what took place at the board meeting. Is it possible to put that right at the front of the recording? I, I think even as you pointed out at the beginning of the meeting tonight, Helen, um, so because I'm hearing that uh, there's a desire to continue the recording, which is totally fine. And maybe we just add in that uh, script of yours that the, the definitive documentation of decisions and, and uh, meeting minutes are, are circulated in a document. David? But you, you will say it a lot more eloquently than that. Stephen, with your experience of with other districts and other superintendents, what are they doing? Do you have any idea? Similar to Helen, I've been hearing as we all went after COVID, there's been some hiccups in different districts around behavior around the board table, either by public or by trustees. But this is a public forum. It is a public meeting. SD60 does not have an issue with accommodating some public that wants to come in. If that changed, we'd have to talk about it then, but we're definitely able to accommodate delegations and the public. Um, I, I just was hearing the same things that Helen had, um, but I, I don't think we need to uh, change our, our recipe too much. And I guess what in the, in the conversation earlier tonight, I'd assumed that we were recording and other people assumed we weren't. And as far as I know, the only meeting that we didn't record was the special board meeting in relationship to uh, the passing of the uh, ratification of the QP agreement. What's happened with the recordings? I would have to have district staff advise us. They, they're on the website and, and Leah, did you? Right. They're on the website. They're on okay. the website, except one that I forgot to take hit it off. record. Okay, yeah. well, I hit record, but I forgot to take it off mute. Yeah. So uh, unless you, I'm hearing uh, Helen. Unless you, the board tells us otherwise, we will continue with recording. Okay, Bill. Okay, I believe since I've been here, we've only had one trustee get up and walk out. Um, a little angry kind of thing. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it was one, maybe twice, but they would have been the same person even. Um, the only reason I was asking was um, it's quote unquote over. So what gets lifted and what doesn't? And this came into effect because of COVID. Yes, so so for us, it was the live stream that definitely the cost and the t uh, having the staff on site outweighed any kind of benefit there. Um, you, the previous board, you, even though there's maybe only one contentious moment that you can recall, there have been some interesting times and jokes that have, that have gone around while the camera is still on and it's still recording. So we just have to be mindful of that. That's all. Because staff does not have the time to go back and rewatch and edit out any kind of uh, <laughs> inappropriate jokes or banter. Ida? I also though think that, you know, if it's a recording of how we proceed on the board, it also gives our public a view of what we as trustees do, like how we act, how we are. And sometimes they can come into the meetings, but they like to watch it. And that gives us an idea of, of who the trustees are. And I don't think staff should ever have to edit something out of the way we yeah. act. Fair enough. Were we prior to COVID recording and putting meetings on the website? Okay. Negative. Thomas. Negative. So this also goes back to acting as if our kids were seeing us on a regular basis, all the kids in the school district. Well, everybody that's in this boardroom um, is meant to have respect for each other and talk amongst ourselves respectfully and everything. So um, I, I, I think that if we took away the recordings, it would it would potentially raise more questions about why did we need to pull away from recordings? Um, were we being inappropriate? All of that kind of stuff. 
I, I say we keep recording and just so minor cues as necessary. Are people feeling at this point that they want a motion recorded in minutes that we will record meetings and put them on the website? Or are you happy with just the record that that's what we've talked about and are happy to have it proceed that way? It came up. We might as well move it. That would be All my right. opinion. Yeah. All right. The motion. So Ida is moving that as practice, we will record our regular board meetings, public portion, and put them on the website. Yes. Did you get that, Leah? Yeah. Could I have a seconder for that motion? Seconded by Thomas. Calling the question on the motion that our meetings will be recorded with those recordings being put on the district website. All in favor? Show me your hand. Motion unanimously, because I didn't hear dissent from Nicole. All right? Yeah, I'm, I'm in favor. On, we, you're in favor? Yes, I'm in favor. Thank you. I knew we were only going to speak up if we, we dissent, but thank you. So moving on to item number 16, we do not have our PNT, PRNTA present. We do not have our QP president present, nor our DPAC president. I don't believe any questions are going to come to us from the public and the press. So could I please get a mover and a seconder to suspend the regular meeting and move into the in-camera? Moved by David, seconded by Bill. All in favor? Carried. We're going to move into camera and we'll take a five-minute bio break. And recording stops. <laughs> Bill, you're looking perplexed. <laughs> Hang on.